okay hello students uh, let us discuss about the topic called as uh, cervical spondylosis let us see what is the causative factors and what happens actually and uh, what are the changes pathological changes that takes, that takes place in this uh, particular condition so uh, before we go into much of details just quickly have a let us have a glimpse of the cervical vertebras as we all know the uh, cervical vertebra here we are looking at the fourth cervical vertebra as superior view we can see the body here the spinous process both the size the transverse processes and the articulating facets superior and inferior the transverse foramen the groove for the spinal nerve and uh, here you can see three vertebra arranged start fourth and fifth in the anterior view and a lateral view showing the vertebra from c2 to t1 now if you see the clinical anatomy of the cervical spine primarily it is designed for mobility support and protection of the spinal cord and nerve roots here also you can see the different parts and the structures and you can see this is the most prominent spinous process of the c7 vertebra if you palpate our posterior part of the neck when you go down from the uh, occiput towards down then you will see the most prominent process where the cervical region ends that is the c7 vertebra and uh, this is the uh, the cervical vertebra we can broadly classify into two types uh, the atypical and the typical atypical we consider the axis atlas and the c7 because of its unique uh, features and then the typical we consider the vertebras from c3 to c6 which have the similar features now this vertebral units or column as a whole is surrounded by strong ligaments muscles and the some of the ligament of this region uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament present in the anterior side of the body of the vertebra this is the PLL posterior longitudinal ligament present the in the posterior aspect of the body of the vertebra ligamentum flavum in the posterior aspect inner side of the vertebral uh, canal and you have the superior and inferior supraspinous ligament and the uh, interspinous ligaments and the ligamentum nuque also you have this facet capsulary ligament again another picture you can see the um, ALL here the PLL the disc ligamentum flavum and the inner side lig interspinous ligament supraspinous ligament another picture depositing the different structures the ligaments the membrane the ligamentum flavum now this is the occipital cervical joint again if we palpate our posterior part of the neck and at the base of the skull we will find the occipital protrum branches and the occipital area from there you can if you come down you can get one for occipital notch or a groove then the C inside if you palpate deeply there is the C1 and the next is the C2 vertebra now this is the c1 we call this atlas and the c2 this is the axis which together forms the atlanto axial joint this transverse ligament anterior arch and this, this is the odontoid process where this is a superior view and this is the lateral view of this atlanto axial joint where you can see the odontoid process is sitting in the 
uh, uh, this notch or the foramen of the C1 vertebra. This is a picture showing the degenerative changes, different changes, like this is the normal disc, a degenerated disc, how it looks like, a bulging disc, you can see here is the bulge herniated disc, the herniation has already taken place and it is impinging the structures. This is a thinning disc out of aging and degeneration, the disc has lost its hydration and it has become thin and this is also this degeneration with osteophyte formation you can see the bony margins of the vertebra which are irregular and with bony spurs and then another uh, x-ray you can see the vertebras the spinous processes here this is the body, inferior articular facets, then the disc spaces, the vertebral bodies, the lamina, posterior arch of C1, anterior arch of C1. This is the dense cervical spondylosis axis. You can see here at the C6, C7. Almost there is a opacity and you can see here there is the lipping of the vertebras. The margins are not regular. There are irregularities and these are known as the osteophytes at the anterior posterior margins. So cervical spondylotic myelopathy CSM was first descri described by Brain et al. in 1952 which is a very common condition. It is estimated that 2% uh, of the hospital admissions will account for this type of cases. Most frequent cause of spinal cord dysfunction in patients older than 55 years and on the basis of radiologic findings 90% of men older than 50, 90% of women older than 60 have evidence of degenerative changes in the cervical spine. A degenerative disease of the cervical spine, the degeneration takes place in the intervertebral discs. It also takes place in the ligaments, which becomes hypertrophied and cartilaginous material. And it is actually believed to be a part of the normal aging process of the vertebral column. And uh, some authors also have included the degenerative changes in the facet joints, which we uh, see as a facet joint arthropathy. And then longitudinal ligaments and ligamentum flavum also becomes thick and hypertrophied. It progresses with age and often develops at multiple interspaces. The most common cause of the progressive spinal cord and nerve root compression is the chronic cervical degeneration. And the spondylotic changes can result ultimately in the stenosis of the spinal canal leading to myelopathy or in the lateral recesses and the foramina leading to radiculopathy which we have discussed today in our class. There are studies involving radiological investigation of asymptomatic individuals that show that spondylotic changes increase with each decades of life. For example, 5 to 10 percent changes increase or is seen by the age of 30 years more than 50% by the age of 45 years and more than 90% by 60 years of age. So, the prevalence of abnormal MRI of the cervical spine as it is related to age in asymptomatic individuals emphasizes the dangers of predicting operative decisions on diagnostic tests 
without precisely matching those findings with the clinical signs and symptoms. The course of cervical spondylosis may be slow and prolonged and it may remain asymptomatic or have mild cervical pain and there may be long periods of non-progressive disability which are typical and few cases the patient's conditions progressively deteriorates and here both the sexes are affected equally it starts earlier in men than in women and sometimes it appears in persons as young as 30 years the morbidity ranges from neck pain to radicular pain diminished cervical range of motion headache that is mainly sub occipital headache myelopathy leading to weakness and impaired fine motor coordination and quadriparesis up to quadriparesis or even sphincteric dysfunction in advanced or severe cases now let us have a look on the pathophysiology what are the changes first that this will go for degeneration they will lose hydration the imbibing capacity of water or retaining water and the there will be changes in the compositions like the proteoglycans or the collagen content there will be changes and they, it will lose the elasticity property with age leading to cracks and fissures so the surrounding ligaments also what will happen they will also lose their elastic properties and develop traction spurs because they will be now more stressed so the disc subsequently collapses as a result of biomechanical incompetence causing the annulus to bulge out so as the disc space narrows the annulus bulges and the facets override so this change actually in turn increases the motion at that particular spinal segment and further increases the damage to the disc or it hastens the damage to the disc so the annulus fissures and herniations may occur and sometimes acute herniation may complicate the chronic spondylotic changes so this is a picture where you can see different changes you can see one side is the uh, the 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 herniated disc here is coming and impinging the nerves or the neurological structures here the thickened ligamentum flavum ligamentum flavum which is present on the inner side of this vertebral foramen here you can see it is because of its thickness is pressing the spinal cord and these are the facet joints where they have developed these bony spurs also these spurs are impinging the nerve roots so all this ultimately lead to this uh, condition so as the dis degeneration occurs the unkinet process overrides and the hypertrophies compromising the ventrolateral portion of the foramen likewise the facet hypertrophy decreases uh, the dorsolateral aspect of the foramen, foramen because if you see here if the facets are hypertrophied or spurs are moving out so this will ultimately decrease the space of the foramen these changes attribute contributes to the radiculopathy associated generally with this cervical spondylosis marginal osteophytes begin to develop and there are additional stresses such as trauma or long-term heavy use may exacerbate this process. These osteophytes stabilize the vertebral uh, bodies adjacent to the level of degenerating disc and increase the weight bearing surface of the vertebral and plates resulting in decreased effective force on the of these structures degeneration of the joint surfaces and the ligaments decreases the motion and can act as a limiting mechanism against further deterioration and thickening and ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament also decreases the diameter of the canal
The blood supply of the spinal cord is an important anatomic factor in this pathophysiology. The reticular arteries in the dural sleeves tolerate compression and repetitive minor trauma poorly. So the spinal cord and the canal size are also the factors responsible for this condition. A congenitally or narrow canal that does not necessarily predispose a person to myelopathy but symptomatic disease rarely develops in individuals with a canal that is larger than 13 mm. Now the flexion of the cervical spine may lead to compression of the spinal cord against the osteophytic bars while the extension may lead to compression against the hypertrophied ligamentum flavum. So ultimately the uh, both sides there will be compression. Now what are the clinical features? In the initial series as reported by Brian et al, the duration of the symptoms ranged from one week to many years and almost half of the patients presented symptoms for more than one year at the time of diagnosis. Common clinical uh, syndromes associated with uh, cervical spondylosis include cervical pain that is mainly suboccipital headache and it includes uh, the direct nerve compression degenerative discs joint ligamentous lesions and segmental instability pain can be perceived locally or it may radiate to the occiput the shoulder scapula or the arms the pain worsens when the patient is in certain positions and can interfere with sleep now radiculopathy Compression of the cervical roots will lead to ischemic changes that causes sensory dysfunction. Example, radicular pain, motor dysfunction, like weakness. So most commonly, as I said, these persons aged 40 to 50 years are vulnerable. An acute herniated disc or chronic spondylotic changes may cause, can cause cervical radiculopathy or myelopathy. C6 root is the most commonly affected, C5, C6, next is the C7. Most cases of cervical radiculopathy resolve with conservative management. Few require surgical interventions. Now this is uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy CSM. Most serious consequence of this cervical spondylosis and the cervical intervertebral disc degeneration especially when it is associated with a very narrow cervical vertebral canal and it is a type of insidious onset which typically becomes apparent in person aged 50 to 60. Complete reversal is very rare once myelopathy occurs. Involvement of the spinchers is unusual at the presentation. In a review study of 1076 patients with CSM, it was seen that there was gait disturbances which was very common. And in this series, spastic gait was one of the first symptoms followed by upper extremity numbness and loss of fine motor controls of the hands. Other common symptoms of CSM were neck pain as well as referred pain in the shoulder or subscapular area. One third of the patients with cervical due to CSM presents with headache and more than two thirds per patients may present with unilateral or bilateral shoulder pain. Significant number of these patients also present with irradiated pain to the arm, forearm, hand pain with long periods of remission. So here you can see a, a top view of a cervical vertebra looking from above and we have demarcated in the middle see this side is the normal side this is the affected side abnormal changes. So here you can see the first change is this the degeneration of uh, that is the osteophytes pressing on the spinal cord leading to myelopathy. Next changes is here the degeneration osteophytes irritating or pressing the nerve root coming of the spinal cord one of the cause for cervical radiculopathy other change is these degenerations causing um, here no here causing no problem because it is not touching the nerve root but there is an osteophytes in the bone so but other side in the normal side you see everything is clear nerves coming and going and the outer parts of the disc, nerve roots emerging, everything is clear. But these are here, you can see a lot of changes. This is the degenerative changes. The causes, as we have discussed, age is most commonly. 
among persons younger than 40, 25% have degenerative disc disease DDD and 4% have foraminal stenosis as confirmed with MRI. In persons older than 40, almost 60% have DDD, 20% have foraminal stenosis as confirmed with MRI. So see the age is an important factor in this cause. Uh, trauma because of injury but that is again a controversial rule. Repetitive subclinical trauma probably influences the onset and the rate of progression of the spondylosis. Repetitive subclinical trauma. Work activity. Yes, significantly higher in patients, higher in patients who carry loads on their uh, heavy loads or they are occupational hazards are there. They give a lot of pressure on the neck, long duration of computer table work jobs or maybe the surgeon's long hours of surgeries or where there is a lot of load on the neck and uh, flexing the neck or extending the neck. Mainly we go for the flexing the neck and doing the work. Now genetics, uh, this factor is not clear but uh, however a retrospective population based study was done by Patel et al that showed that genetics may play a role in the development of cervical spondylotic myelopathy. Patients which are who are older than 50 years who have normal cervical spine radiographic findings are significantly more likely to have a sibling with a normal or mildly abnormal radiographic results. Physical examination uh, will find decreased range of motion in the cervical spine especially with neck extension, hand clumsiness, sensory deficits, hyperreflexia in lower extremities and in the upper extremities below the level of the lesion, a characteristically broad-based stooped and spastic gait, extensive plantar reflex in severe myelopathy. And some of the physical examination, uh, some of the provocative tests or the signs like the radicular pain, some of the signs actually, these are some of the signs, the spurling, the Hermite and the Hoffman sign. The spurling sign says that there is radicular pain exacerbated by the extension and lateral bending of the neck towards the side of the lesion, causing additional foraminal compromise because when there is extension and lateral bending towards the lesion that causes more constriction of that foramina or narrowing and the signs are aggravated. Hermite sign, generalized electrical shock sensation associated with neck extension. In the Hoffman sign, there is a reflex contraction of the thumb and the index fingers occurs in response to nipping of the middle finger. This sign, this sign is an evidence of an upper motor neuron lesion. And now in imaging this uh, <coughs> plain cervical radiography, it is a routine in every patient so it's suspected uh, cervical spondylosis valuable in evaluating the uncovertebral and facet joints the foramen intervertebral disc spaces and the osteophytes formation flexion extension views may be needed to detect instability this is one of the x-rays showing the degenerative changes in the cervical spine narrow disc spaces and the bone spurs irregularity on the emergence of the bodies of vertebra, these are bone spurs, osteophytes. The myelography with CT tomography, computer tomography, can also be used to assess spinal and foraminal stenosis. Since myelography is a method of invasive nature, most physicians depend on MRI in diagnosing cervical spondylosis. Myelography adds in anatomic information in evaluating spondylosis. Maybe special specifically useful in visualizing the nerve root takeoff. CT scanning with or without intrathecal dye can be used to estimate the diameter of the canal. CT scans may demonstrate small lateral osteophytes and calcific opacities in the middle of the vertebral body. MRI is a considerable advantage or it is advanced in the use of imaging. The advantages are it is a direct imaging in multiple planes, better definition of neural elements, increased accuracy in evaluating intrinsic spinal cord diseases and it is a non-invasive procedure. The false positive and false negative MRI results occur frequently in patients with cervical reticulopathy. Therefore, MRI results and clinical findings should be used when interpreting root compression. 
Now the T-weighted hyperintensity images at the level of spinal compression have also been shown to correlate with CSM severity and has been supposed to be an important prognostic factor. Such findings are thought to represent edemine inflammation. On the other hand, the T1 hypointensity has been shown to be a more of severe sign representing ischemia, myelomalacia or gliosis, which has been correlated with the postoperative worst outcome. This is one of the MRI pictures of the degenerative changes and the narrowing and trying to compress the cord. Histology. There will be thinning and fragmentation of the articular cartilage which may is, which is observed. The normal smooth white articular surface becomes irregular and yellow. There will be continued loss of articular cartilage leading to exposure of areas of subcontral bone which appear as a shiny foci on the art articular surfaces known as abonneration and the fibrosis seen increased bone formation and cystic changes frequently occur in the underlying bone. Loss of articular cartilage stimulates new bone formation usually in the form of nodules that is osteophytes at the bony edges. So differential diagnosis we can you have to rule out like some conditions congenital arnold carey malformation tethered cord syringomyelia acquired cases like trauma herniated intervertebral disc kyphosis extramedullary hematosis hematopoiesis epidural lipomatosis neoplastic conditions like spinal cord tumors carcinomatous meningitis paraneoplastic syndrome vascular conditions like hematoma spinal cord infarction spinal cord avm Autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, Davic syndrome, infectious like the paraspinal abscesses, osteomyelitis, pyogenic discitis, AIDS, myelopathy, tuberculosis, spinal meningitis, viral and syphilitic involvements, a myotropic lateral sclerosis. Physical therapy plays an important part in the treatment and the management. Immobilization of the cervical spine is the mainstay of conservative treatment for patients with cervical spondylosis. Immobilization limits the motion of the neck thereby reducing the nerve irritation. Soft cervical collars are recommended for daytime use only but uh, they are unable to appreciably limit the motion of the cervical spine. The more rigid ones are the Philadelphia collar, the Minerva body jacket which can significantly immobilize the cervical spine so you can see this is the philadelphia collar and this is the minerva body jacket the patient's tolerance and compliances are considerations when uh, any of the braces are used a program of isometric cervical exercises may help to limit the loss of muscle tone that results from the use of more restrictive orthosis molded cervical pillows can better align the spine during sleep and provide symptomatic relief of some for some patients. The use of cervical exercises has been advocated in patients with cervical spondylosis. Isometric exercises are documented to be beneficial to maintain the strength of the neck muscles. Neck and upper back stretching, light aerobics are also recommended. The exercise programs are best initiated and monitored by a physical therapist. Passive modalities generally involve the application of heat to the tissues either by means of devices like moist heat packs or sort of diatomy. These are some of the isometric neck exercises which we teach to the patient. Uh, mechanical traction is widely used technique but uh, it may be useful because it promotes immobilization of the cervical region and into widens the foraminal openings. However, traction in the treatment of cervical pain was not better than a placebo in two randomized trials. Manual therapy, massage and mobilization may provide further relief for patients with cervical spondylosis. Mobilization is performed by therapist, physical therapist and is characterized by application of gentle pressure within or at the limits of normal motion with the goal of increasing the range of motion. Manual traction may be better tolerated than mechanical traction in some patients. Occupation therapy, yes, the patients with upper extremity weakness often lose their ability to perform the activities of daily living 
vocational activities or recreational activities so lifestyle modifications lifestyle modifications are necessary and they involve an evaluation of workplace ergonomics postural training next school therapy stress management and vocational assistance disability can be improved with specific strengthening exercises of the upper extremities special splinting to compensate for weakness and the use of assistive devices that allow the patient to perform previously impossible activities drugs are mainly used the nsids non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs sometimes steroids opioids drugs for radicular pain like carbamazepine and pregabaline With non-operative treatment, approximately 75% of patients have complete or partial but significant relief of symptoms. Non-operative treatment of spondylosis with radiculopathy has not been compared with surgical therapy in randomized trials. But uh, Katanka et al. compared in a randomized study conservative and surgical treatment of spondylotic cervical myelopathy to establish predictive factors for outcome after conservative treatment and surgery. The clinical, the electrophysiological, and the imaging parameters are examined to reveal how they characterize the clinical outcome. The patients with good outcome in the conservatively treated group were of older age before treatment, had normal central motor conduction time, and possessed a larger transverse area of the spinal cord. The patients with good outcome in the surgically treated group has a uh, more serious clinical picture. The conclusion was patients should preferably be treated conservatively if they have a spinal transverse uh, area larger than 70 square millimeter are of older age and have normal CMCT. A surgery which is more suitable for patients with clinically worse status and lesser transverse area of spinal cord. Now what are the surgical interventions? Indications for surgery include progressive neurological deficits when the neurological deficits progress and they are not uh, are deteriorating when they are deteriorating and they are not stopping so there is a progressive neurological deficits a documented compression of the sorry cervical nerve root and spinal cord intractable pain the aims of surgery is to relieve the pain and neuronal neural structure neuronal structure compression as well as in selected cases to achieve stabilization so the aim is basically to relieve the pain to relieve the compression and to achieve stabilize stabilization the approaches for surgery may be anterior or posterior or may be combined anterior posterior. Anterior approaches include the disectomy with bone graft or without bone graft, then cervical instrumentation. Posterior approaches include decompressive laminectomy or laminoplasty, hemilaminectomy, foraminotomy. The approach selected is determined by the type of the location of the pathology and the surgeon's preference. When the anterior compression of the spinal cord is the most important component, anterior techniques are preferred. For example, are the disc protrusions or the marked osteophytosis. Anterior approaches have the advantage of more readily restoring the cervical lordosis, which is useful for cases where the kyphosis exacerbates the spinal cord compression. While using this approach, the compressive factor should not exceed 2 to 3 disc levels. An anterior approach is technically more demanding, carries a high risk and often requires fusion. There are mainly two posterior approaches for the treatment of CSM. One is laminectomy with or without fusion and the other is laminoplasty. Posterior approaches may be considered when the pathology is located at the posterior portion of the spinal canal, for example in case of hypertrophied ligamentum flavum. Nevertheless, posterior decompression also addresses anterior compression because it indirectly decompresses the spinal cord by analyzing the, enlarging the spinal canal. When compared to anterior approaches, posterior approaches offer advantage for the treatment of CSM and it enables direct visualization of the spinal canal and wide decompression of the spinal cord, cord and nerve roots. Procedures such as laminectomy without fusion and laminoplasty 
uh, also presents this advantage like development of instability or post laminectomy kyphosis furthermore none of the posterior approaches enable primary resection of anterior pathology the laminoplasty it preserves most of the bony posterior vertebral elements and therefore may decrease the risk of post laminectomy kyphotic deformity in comparison with laminectomy besides that in comparison with laminectomy with fusion laminoplasty seems to be present a decreased incidence of adjacent level degeneration by preserving normal cervical range of motion till laminectomy with and without fusion this is an old technique for posterior decompression of csm uh, the laminectomy without fusion and the major post operative complication of such approach is post laminectomy instability so the group of patients in risk for such complications are those who present signs of pre existing instability and those in which aggressive facet resection is performed in these cases instrument stabilization at the time of laminectomy is recommended so along with laminectomy we have to go for instrument stabilization instrumented fusion serves to both stabilize the cervical spine as well as secure the spine in an optimal lordotic configuration so this is the anterior surgical approach anterior osteopatectomy posterior surgical approaches like foraminotomy laminectomy laminoplasty for performing a decompressive cervical laminectomy or laminotomy posterior approach the compressive changes should be present in more than two or three disc levels the so called keyhole foraminotomies are carried out at uh, levels involved with radiculopathy the posterior approach to cervical radiculopathy has similar results as of the anterior approach when used for the proper indications surgical intervention for cervical myo myopathy is controversial once moderate neurological signs and symptoms develop surgical intervention is likely to be beneficial over further medical treatment the predictive factors for the outcome of surgery are the age the duration of symptoms preoperative clinical status of the patient anterior posterior diameter of the canal area of the spinal cord at the level of maximal compression findings of hyper intense areas in the spinal cord one level or multi level compression congenital diameter of the spinal canal expressed as by pavlov's index chosen method to decompress now prevention is to avoid high impact exercises like running jumping maintain cervical range of motion with daily rom exercises maintain neck muscle strength especially neck extension strength avoid holding the head in one position for long period for example driving or watching tv avoid prolonged neck extension be careful when performing physical activities that are done infrequently such as activities can trigger a flare in the symptoms so thank you students for listening and watching this video any kinds of doubts uh, i'll be happy to discuss in our google classroom or whatsapp and the most common things whatever we have discussed in last 4 to 5 classes regarding the whole spine is one thing is common is the the conditions which result are because of the compression of the structures the vital structures or the neurological structures that pass through the vertebral column the spinal cord the nerve roots if it is a narrowing of the canal it may be because of a slipped vertebra over the other like spondylolisthesis where we have seen that there is a complete breakdown of the parts in the articularis spondylolysis and then ultimately spondylolisthesis ultimately narrowing and causing spinal canal stenosis and uh, there are degenerative changes here in spondyl spondylosis where we have seen that ultimately it will affect the structures and the symptoms are aggravated or precipitated so uh proper care at the proper time proper diagnosis at the right time then precautions do's and don'ts 
and the lifestyle modifications, the work ergonomics, mainly for decks of people or surgeons or who have long hours of uh, same position working are very much important for us as physios to aware them and to uh, make them correct. So I think we have got an idea of this condition and once again thank you. We are open for the doubts. Uh, okay, thank you.